is God and how does he relate to human beings? To some degree, this, de this can be answered by, you know, advanced philosophy, metaphysics, theology. Yet God has also given us an answer in the revealed truth of the biblical stories. And in particular, he's get revealed this in the story of the call to Moses in the burning bush, which contains profound, not only historical, but also moral, symbolic, and metaphysical truth, which can enrich our knowledge of this, of these and other, of this and other fundamental questions. So in Exodus 2.23, it says, quote, The Israelites were groaning under the bondage and cr cried out, and their cry, cry for help from the bondage rose up to God. God heard their mourning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took Moses of them. So when some people picture God, they picture an impersonal, static, and aloof entity unaware of the suffering of mere human beings, and certainly not able to have emotions, for instance. Um... Yet this is actually a logical requirement of the relationship between God and human beings, which is one of sympathy. So Chris Langan explains this in his press in his great, great video, it's called God and Emotions on CTMU Radio, which I'll link in the description, that the very possibility for emotion is a function of the emotelic subsyntax as a universal distributed form, UDF, which is God's syntax which distributes to the most primitive form of consciousness, not only among humans, but also among plants, animals, and other, and other life forms. So because human beings are in images of God, this all-embracing syntax carries with it the possibility for a far more coherent form of compassion, love, judgment, than even humans possess. So when the, these types of responses are characterized by the, the prophets, for instance, they have more than just allegorical meaning. So, God, and that's why God is actually a personal God, a sympathetic God with whom you can relate on an individual level. So, in the, and on an emotional level as well. So, in the story of Exodus, God decides to make himself known through personal acts in history, through a redeemer prophet, um, Moses. And how he does this is essentially the central story of the Hebrew Bible. So God reveals his essence to Moses in symbolic form. In Exodus 3, 2, it says, An angel of the Lord appeared to him, Moses, in a blazing fire out of a bush. He gazed, and there was the bush all aflame, yet the bush was not consumed. So this represents God's essence. The bush burns because fire is a symbol of transformation, but surface-level transformation. So God evolves with the universe. God hears the outcry of his people, yet the bush is not consumed because God's God's transcendental essence, God himself, remains the same. So God is paradoxically eternal and exists outside of time, but is also constantly interacting with his creation and with humans. So God reveals himself essentially as a paradox, as, as close as the vein on your neck, yet as far as the high, yet as distant as the highest of heavens, everywhere and nowhere, everything for everyone all at once. God is showing Moses that he's not an impersonal force, that he cares, he cares about the suffering of humans and calls us to action. So God calls to Moses out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses answers, Hineni, which means here I am. It's a humility and readiness to serve God. So God says, I have noticed the sufferings of my people in Egypt and have heard their cries because of their taskmasters. I am aware of their sufferings. The cries of the Israelites have reached me and I have seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So God is deeply concerned with the suffering of humans. The Lubavitcher Rebbe said, to each of us, God pleads, let me come back to my garden, to the place in which I found delight when it all began. So God is yearning to redeem the world and his people. So God says to Moses, I've come down to rescue the Israelites from the Egyptians and bring them to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh and you will free my people, the Israelites, from Egypt. So later Moses asks God, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your father's house has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is this God's name? What should I say to them? And God responds in one of the most perplexing and iconic lines in the whole Bible. He says, Eia asher Eia. And the most common translation of this is, I am who I am. But Eia, as the imperfect form of Haya, which means to be, can mean in this context either I am, I will be, or I was. So, the theologian Victor Hamilton suggests nine possible translations of the phrase. He says, I am who I am, I am who I was, I am who I shall be, I was who I am, I was who I was, I was who I shall be, I shall be who I am, 
I shall be who I was, I shall be who I shall be. So God, who had previously revealed himself as a paradox, is now showing the resolution to that paradox. God is structuring himself the same way he does in the CTMU as a super tautology, as absolute truth. Adonai Eloechem Emet, the Lord your God is truth. I am who I am. Everywhere I choose to be myself, I am the self-subsisting one. I am freedom itself. So, and I will free you. And that's the story of the Exodus. So, in short, God encompasses and transcends every possible state of the universe and gives existence to all of reality. Um, and seen this way, God actually exists as a logical necessity. It couldn't be any other way. You can't create a model of reality without that as its central premise, that God exists. And so God can, per and God is also, is also free. God can perform public miracles and bring deliverance for people that he chooses as his own. And the Exodus is that story. So God says to Moses, you shall say to the Israelites, hey, yeah, which means I will be. The divine I will be has sent me to you. So God is actualizing the timeline through his future essence, the divine I will be, the AEA, to redeem his people through his image, through the, through his image faithfully mirrored in his prophet Moses. So it's not an impersonal God yet again, but a God who acts in history. So the God, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of human beings has sent me to you. This shall be my name forever, God says. So Moses says later, Please, O Lord, I have never been a man of words, either in times past or now that you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And God replies, Who gives man speech? Who makes him dumb or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with you as you speak and will instruct you what to say. So this is a point my friend and CTMU compatriot Greg Wilford has made that as you accept the charge to the faithful God's word, the divine logos, the, it, inheres with, it inheres within you, God's word, and your works and your human words are no longer of your own making, but are an instrument for God's redemption from the magic part of your brain, as Tom Petty said uh, when he was discussing his um, music. So this is, I think, the point that God was com com communicating to Moses. This is the point another CTMU compatriot, com Coronius Focus made, that the Logos, which means the word, is, tr but is truthful perception or speech manifested within the universe as a creative and as a redemptive force. And this is important to be, keep in mind, especially in the biblical stories when we get to the Moses' revelation of the Torah at Mount Sinai. So... God gives Moses the power to perform miracles, to turn his staff into a snake and back into a staff, but only to bring Israel and Pharaoh into awe and fear of God. These miracles are a means to an end. So it says, when they heard that the Lord has taken note of the Israelites and that he has seen their plight, they bowed low in homage. And Pharaoh says, I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. And made the Israelite slaves workload even, wor even more cruel and crushing. So when we get to the story of the ten plagues this one last line is paramount so i'll read it in its entirety god the lord is it, it says then the lord said to moses you shall soon see what i shall do to pharaoh he shall let them go because of a greater might indeed because of a greater might he shall drive them from his land through the redemption of the israelites and the consecration of a chosen people god is establishing himself as the king of kings as the highest and loftiest principle in his creation above Pharaoh, above all the kings and conquerors whose might and wealth pale in comparison to the king of the universe. So people will sometimes ask, what makes the God of Abraham and Moses greater than all the other gods? And you know, aside from the fact that the other ones are fake, the God, but also God, God is being himself. I am that I am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, ultimate ultimate reality as a compassionate entity, as a personal and a compassionate entity. He contains and supersedes the entirety of re reality and is thus alone worthy of worship. So if there were such gods as, you know, Poseidon or Osiris or what have you, they could only derive their existence from God Almighty. 
But second, secondly and critically, God needs us, needs human beings, humankind, as partners in creation to forge a world filled with justice and compassion and calls the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God upon the earth and calls us as the faithful and as humans to create that world together. You were created for this very purpose, to lead our world from slavery to freedom, from Egypt to Canaan, back to the garden by manifesting God's word in the universe as a redemptive force. Let the light shine forth in the darkness. May the peace of our Father be in heaven be upon you. Like and subscribe. Peace.